Billy and Ian from the Colt. Welcome to the noise. Thank Hello. You. The cult, you've almost sort of outgrown yet another name. You're hardly cult status anymore, are you? No, we're now all status. <laughs> yeah, we're now status quo. <laughs> Actually, um, earlier in this tour, in your American leg, you must have played to some pretty big stadiums. You um, played with Billy Idol's band, I believe. Yep, we did. We're trying to forget it now. We did, yeah, for months, about three and a half months. We were on the road with him. Yeah. And his band. We did, yeah, we did sort of quite big places, I suppose. Not particularly big by American standards. I mean, it was anything between. So, like the mid sized venues, like uh, sports arenas, 15, 20,000 people. <clears throat> Do you change your performance at all when you play those sides of arenas as opposed to, you know, the 2,000 seaters and pubs that you, you're playing in some parts of Australia? A pub? Are we playing a pub? I'm going home. <laughs> Nobody told me we're playing a pub. No, I've never played a pub in my life. <laughs> <sighs> Do we? We wear bigger shoes, I suppose. <laughs> Give that kind of impression, that, you know, you yeah. look bigger than what you really are. <laughs> yeah. No, it, those kind of gigs, not really. You just do it. it you just do everything bigger, I suppose. You know? <laughs> You just do everything bigger. Leap a bit higher. No, what you have to, when you're backing someone up on a tour like that, you have to shorten your set down, so that's pain. We, would do, we usually do like an hour and three quarters, two hours, and uh, Billy Idol were doing 45 minutes every night, and that was it. So you just get going, and it was time to finish. You know? yeah. yeah, that was a drag. Yeah, I hear that the two bands got along very well, though, and that there were a few practical jokes being played. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was the most memorable one? Had to be the end of the tour. We dressed up our bass player as Steve Stevens. Spent four hours meticulously recreating a Steve Stevens outfit out of gaffer tape, which for you is, is gaffer tape's the uh, sticky tape that technical people around rock bands use. It's world famous. The world is stuck together with gaffer tape. We made this uh, sort of white Steve Stevens outfit out of towels and gaffer tape. We actually like, he had a pair of like, uh, running shoes on and uh, we taped seven up cans to give him that kind of Steve Stevens heel which he's well known for, and we did his hair and everything. And we threw him on stage, dressed up like that, <laughs> with like a rubber guitar. I mean, you had to be there to appreciate it, you know. <laughs> it's, all on, uh, it's all on video, eight, though. Mm. We'll be coming out in the cult movie. I look forward to that. One of the things you did in the States was uh, you played at the New Music Seminar, and in fact, Billy, you were on the panel, uh, the last panel, the artist's panel. Oh, yeah, that was very interesting. Along with a few other famous people or infamous people. Mm, yeah, it was kind of good, yeah. in a way. It was a weird thing to do. I've never done anything like that before. Basically, you were um, answering questions from the audience, weren't you? Yeah, I, it was kind of weird because, you know, because they had, like, Al Green there. It was sort of like a little bit like everybody wanted to really make, pay homage to the greatness of the man, which is like, I didn't really think that was the point of a new music seminar and a discussion that was supposedly oh, there to help young artists. It was kind of... I got, that was a bit of a drag, but that's a very American yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, you were sitting next to Dion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was sitting Did next to that? Dion, yeah. Well, well I don't particularly... Dion, he's very good. I've got all his records. I didn't really know too much about Dion, to tell you the truth. Probably before so. your time, actually. Yeah, it was before my mother's time. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was good. I think the thing was OK. It's not particularly new music anymore. It's a bit like an in, a regular industry convention. Mm. Is the cult new music? Uh, we've been going for four years, you know. I kind of think we've transcended all that kind of independent new new wave, new music vibe. You know, we just... Uh, we did it as a favour to the um, new music seminar people because we'd, we'd been involved with them in the past. And, uh, you know, it seemed like the, the final thing with the, the kind of blow the new music myth apart, you know, one of the reasons for doing it. Mm. And uh, I think when people came to see the show, they realised that we weren't really part of that whole thing, you know. A bit new, more new music than Al Green, I think. Uh, yeah, right. And Dio. Yeah, you know. You know what I mean? But it uh, gets confusing, though, doesn't it? It really, it really does. I mean, uh, Al Green makes new music from new records. <laughs> I thought it was interesting, Billy, that um, when you were asked who influenced you to get into music, I think that was the question, you said it was the Sex Pistols. Yeah, I, I didn't say that to be awkward. It was the, I just answered the question directly. That was the band that I saw that made me actually think that you could possibly be in a band and do it as opposed to, uh, you know, just play guitar for a hobby or play, like, in your local clubs and stuff in the city that you're from. 
they, the whole punk thing opened it up. So that's why I picked that. It wasn't to just be awkward, because they all expected me to say Led Zeppelin, which is what they did. The thing is, the cult's been through quite a few transformations since the early days. The name has changed two times, um, but also the music and the, the image has changed. Yeah, well, like we've been going for four years, you know. It's more of an evolution. I'm just constantly influenced by things, new ideas. I mean, we've never got kind of in a rut at all. Um, I mean, as regards to name changes, Southern Death Cult was a completely different entity to this, you know. All we decided to do, that was a band that I was singer for when I left them. All we decided to do when we started was to capitalise on the success of Southern Death Cult and take the name Death Cult and have all the fans that we built up with Southern Death Cult identified with that name. So we had an instant following, you know. And here's me and him sitting in the bedroom with like two songs. <laughs> and like, <laughs> two songs and an instant it, following. It was, it was like a blag, you know, it was like a real blag, but um, sort this out. We've got a record deal and everything together out of it. You had a record deal on, on two songs? Yeah, we had, we had a record deal on like no songs. No songs. We, we were a bit smart in a way, I think, in retrospect, because a lot of that scene that was happening in England at the time kind of ground to nothing. And we figured that well, once we'd got the band together, we'd best get it off the ground rather quickly before the whole thing sort of ran out of steam, which it did. I mean, if you look back to the amount of bands that were up and coming and getting deals at that point, there's very few left that are actually out now, like The Mission and System, well, Andrew Eldritch, which is Sisters of Mercy. Other than that, I don't seem to see anybody else around. There's nobody left. <laughs> Cult's gone through a number of transformations, the name changed twice, and your image has changed over the last few years. I mean, even the look of the band yeah, is completely different. Yeah, there's two years in between those records, you know. Two years is a long time. I said, see, um, first time I was coming to Australia, you know, people don't really realise the band's been going that long. It wasn't like an overnight thing, you know. It was always, if you, if you look at the Love album, for example, there's two tracks on there that stand out, like Love and the Phoenix. I think we're kind of, um, you know, it showed which direction the band was going to go in. They were like, you know, blatantly rock tracks, you know. So the band goodness, was you know. sort of still feeling its direction we just at that, that it, stage? We were just like focusing our energies and learning about ourselves, you know. Developing the character was coming out, and playing styles, singing styles, song writing was getting much better, you know. It wasn't like shrouded in mystery and multi layered guitar kind of thing. We just had our first hit as well. <clears throat> I don't know whether people know, I mean, that. What actually happened was Sanctuary came out as a single in England in sort of spring of 85, and that was a hit, and that was the first record we'd had that had actually got in the national, the big chart, as opposed to, like, the independent charts. So going in to do the Love album, it was basically everybody around the band just was saying, well, uh, whatever you're doing, just do more of it, because uh, you're doing something right. And it was, I mean, literally, we started recording the record, and we had to go and do Top of the Pops, and. It was all very thrilling and exciting, so there wasn't any, like, worrying about things. It was no, nothing to worry about. It was all a very positive thing, so with the record, we just did what we liked. Anything that we wanted to put on it, there was no, I don't know, constraints. There was no worries about, we sort of, no worries. We, there was no, um, like with the Electric album, once you've set, had success with a certain kind of music, people always start going, oh, they've changed, oh, they don't sound like what they used to, they're terrible. With the Love album, we didn't have to sell like anything. We could do whatever we wanted, and that, that was the result. And also, it was only the second album we'd ever made. Ever, I mean, n neither of us had ever been um, involved in making an album other than the Dreamtime album, which was the first proper album the Cult did. Or any other kind of, like, proper recording, really, because the producers we worked with in the past were just, like, sort of Joe Bloggs, you know, sort of a part-time producer. We had one guy that we worked with uh, for the Dreamtime album, a guy called Joe Julian. Who uh, we, we did Spirit Walker, and uh, he recorded it and mixed it within like sort of ten hours. In fact, he mixed it within an hour. And he said, "I'm off. I'm off home for me dinner." Yeah. That was the kind of vibe, you know. It was kind of weird. And then Steve Brown was the first proper professional producer we ever got involved with, so we were a bit we were a bit wogged out because he was a very yeah. sort of state of the art producer. He was really into using all the effects and multi layering things and creating like he just had this vision of like kind of a really deep, heavy sound, you yeah. know multi-textured sound, and we kind of went, oh, this sounds good, you know, because it sounded professional for a change. So, um, in between the period between Love and the Electric album, we, we basically realised what the strengths were of the band, 
We just decided we wanted to strip down the whole thing, just get to the meat of the matter. You know, I think the next album probably be a cross between Love and The Electric. Mm. Album. Mm. We'll have the best of both worlds, you know. Right. Well, the producer of uh, The Electric album was Rick Rubin, who's best known for his work with the Def Jam artists. Why did you choose him? Well, when you consider Rick Rubin, you know, as being associated with the, the um, rap artist, what really put um, Beastie Boys and um, Run DMC onto the, the world scene was the fact that he mixed it with rock music. And that's Rick's main bag was rock music, and that's why we got involved with him, because he's really got a good ear for guitars. He really likes his guitars a lot. And also he's got, you know, likes similar bands to us, has long hair and a beard, and he's just like a blue cheer ACDC freak. So it's kind of exciting to work with him. There's no, not one mention of James Brown or anybody like that during that session, you know? Yeah, it's it was kind of cool. interesting. And he also wasn't like your own. A lot of producers we encounter are terribly scared of record companies. They seem to, you know, they're so worried about budgets and keeping happy because they have to work. You know, once they've finished an album with one artist, they like to think they'll get work from the company again. And the Electric album we actually recorded twice, which is fairly well documented. I mean, there's no point in going into the story. Suffice it to say, we'd spent a lot of money and done it once, and Rick really was only supposed to do a remix and record just two tracks. And between us, we all just decided that the, the only way to make the record sound how we wanted it was to re-record it. And I don't think a lot of producers would have had the guts to do that. They would have been too scared. But considering he owns his own, like, multi-million dollar company, which is what Def Jam is now, he, uh, he, he didn't really bother him too much. A number of the Def Jam bands, such as the Beastie Boys and Run DMC, often use things that, um, guitar riffs or whatever, that come almost, sound like they come directly from Aerosmith or ACDC no, or Led Zeppelin. They, do. <laughs> they do, they come off the they records. And they get sampled or whatever. Yeah. Right. They sample them. I like that, I think it's really good. Yeah. A bit of piracy. It's kind of neat when they do the live shows, what they do is they get a special record pressed up just purely for scratching and dubbing in to get all the, like, the effects put on a record. It's kind of interesting, that. And they just sing over the top. The thing is, of course, the cult's often been accused also of ripping off a lot of the rock bands or some of the rock bands of the late 60s, early 70s. We've ripped off everyone. <laughs> really have. Seriously, though, how, what's your reaction to that? Um, mm, I, this, I mean, to make rock records, I mean, if you, I mean, our standpoint on rock music at the moment is that a lot of people make really AOR corporate rock records. They make them to get played on the radio. They don't make them, I think, with like a real intent to make good music. I think the corporate mentality creeps in and they just want to get stuff played on the radio. And I think that's kind of worrying. It's like, that it just propagates the thing where established artists get played all the time and new bands don't really get a chance. I mean, it's, it's just a typical American thing of selling baked beans over the radio. You know, it's like they'll play what their listeners, they think their listeners want to hear and then they can sell them Oldsmobiles. And we just didn't want to do a record that was like that. I, I don't know, it was just a, a point. We, we felt that a lot of bands for a period of time that had been slagged off so badly in England, i.e. the late 60s, early 70s, we just felt that a lot of those bands did something right. I mean, rock music didn't exist particularly till like sort of 1967, wasn't it, that year, the good, the wonderful mm. year, man, when I was in short pants and eating ice cream. Um, they, it seemed that before everything was rock then, and then suddenly it went into categories of acid rock, heavy metal, folk, blues, and they, they kind of went off in, in tangents. And um, it, came a, it became a tad cliche, but I think like there was a couple of really great albums made in the early 70s in terms of blues rock. And we just wanted to not recreate it, but just learn from, you know, a way of doing things that seems to have been lost, an art that's lost of like... It's kind of more traditional and yeah, natural. You know, blues-based rock music is the ultimately natural form of rock, I think white rock music, you know, white music in England. <laughs> If you look at most artists these days, <clears throat> they've been influenced by one way or another by blues-based rock from the 70s. You know, people like Prince, for example. If it wasn't um, for people like Hendrix, etc., etc., Prince wouldn't even exist, you know? Um, so it's, it's very traditional things. what we've been brought up with. It's what's influenced us. 
and I don't think we sound, <clears throat> we have our own sound, our own character, our own identity. You know, I don't sound like Robert Plant, I don't sound like anybody else. You know, I've got a very distinctive voice, but he's got a very distinctive guitar sound as well. You know, those are things we've developed over, like, since we've been playing and singing and stuff. Oh. So um, we go, well, boo hard, we blow your nose at those. Yeah. Well, obviously, general direction. Yeah. yeah, well, obviously, everybody is influenced by what's gone before. Of course, I think it's cool, you know. To. It's like when the uh, Beatles first came out, people were going, they just sound like Buddy Holly, the Everly Brothers, we don't, we're not really interested. Mm. You know, we want the American thing. When the Beatles were, like, pushing around, trying to get record deals and stuff, people were going, we, want, we don't want this, we want American stuff. Mm. We want the original but stuff. But I think perhaps why the criticism of the cult has been so consistent, mm. um, you know, apart from that general nastiness of the British music press anyway, mm. but there are certain guitarists on certain cult songs that Blues sound... music's very traditional. But, yeah, I mean, you like, know, the no opening point, of Wildflowers, no point, like an ACDC. Yeah, but there's no point, I mean, some things occur naturally, you know. Some, there's natural chords there, which sequences which sound good, which people will use. You probably hear those chord sequences on like about, I don't know, quite a lot of rock records anyway. They're just they're the best sounding chords. You get the best power out of them, you know? Put the best melodies to them. I think a lot of the problem with modern music and attitudes to it is that everybody's so concerned and, and interested in being modern and original and what they tend to forget ultimately is like the quality of the songs that was the whole problem with the positive punk scene in england that people were so into being original and dropping names of bizarre german art movements that really they forgot about writing songs and ultimately all those people are on unemployment now and i think that you know i defend our we, we're actually a bit too soft on people that say we sound like stuff because there's thousands of bands that rip people off like simply blatantly. red blatantly <clears throat> What's so original about Sade? It's just people don't know the forms of music that they're influenced by because they're not, we're never as popular as Led Zeppelin, who are probably the biggest band in the world. So when you get a band that in any way do rock stuff, um, it, it, easy, everybody knows about Led Zeppelin. Everybody grew up listening to Led Zeppelin, and particularly people in the media. And I think they're a little bit embarrassed about it. You yeah, know, that's they, the thing that's happened in Britain. I think we were the first young band in England to come out and say, this is what we're into. These are our influences. We don't like Bauhaus. We, we, we don't like weird music. You know, we like really natural, powerful, energetic music. This is what we're into. And everyone, kind of, and everyone just kind of shot us down in flames. Oh. Six months later, as soon as we start working with Rick Rubin, Def Jam thing, everyone went like, OK, we can dig this. Because cool, cool, yeah. Def Jam are cool, so it must be cool. Then you've got like all these uh, rock bands coming out of England now, and everyone's growing their hair. You know, Joe, and the thing about Rick Rubin, it was, he didn't care. Rick Rubin doesn't care. He, he just cares about good and people who've got guts and people who've got a bit of talent. He doesn't really care about whether or not it's the most strikingly original noise ever to come out. It's not really relevant. I think what matters is how good the songs are, how good you are at doing it. And I think one of the things about the call is we're good at it. We're good at being a rock band. There's a lot of terrible rock bands out there. We've actually got a bit of quality and a bit of a natural talent. I found, I found at one point when I first started that I really wanted to sound like uh, people like Joplin. I really wanted to sound like Janis Joplin. So just to push it so hard to try and sound like it. But I was really unhappy with my own voice, you know. I'm just curious, Joplin and Led Zeppelin in their heyday, mm. we're talking about, you know, 60s come 70s, late yeah, 60s, early 70s. We're also talking 70s. about the cream of music. How, how old know? were you? We're talking about How like, old were you? What were you doing at... We were little. When, in their we heyday. were toddlers. So when did you discover It was after punk music? rock, because what happened was punk rock just blew everything apart. The fragments were just, they could never be put back together again in the music scene. It's never ever going to be the same again. But um, when it died, I was going out to clubs in Liverpool and I was starting to listen to things like, I don't know, for some reason people were playing The Doors. I think people were just like really bored with what was happening around about time. Nobody wanted to listen to Joy Division. Nobody wanted to listen to Killing Joke. It was just so dire and gloomy, you know. Everyone was trying to like rediscover the past. I think everyone actually asked the same question, what happened before 1976? You know, the things that people were bellowing against were things like, yes, you know, bands like Yes and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, progressive rock bands, you know, sort of like sixth form visions of, uh, I don't know, people living on tops of mountains with dragons. <laughs> Concepts <laughs> coming along, you know. Uh, but, uh, and that was it, you know, I'd start hanging at these places and listen to this kind of music, it was like blues-based rock music. It was really exciting, because it was new to me, it was fresh. 
when I heard Hendrix doing Purple Haze, I thought, this guy, this is incredible. You so know? tell me, what records are you listening to these days? Hmm, all that stuff. <laughs> no, I guess a um, few things come along now and again, you know. I've always, I've always bought every new Prince album. And he's never let me down in any of his records, you know. Mm -hmm. um, new Aerosmith album thinks really good. Guns N' Roses, I like them a lot. Billy, um, what about you? Um, hmm. I think of a new record that come out there actually. The White like. Snake album was we, we played that to death, and then we just realised that there was only one good song in it, you know. Yeah, a lot of albums like I like the White Snake album for for a while, and I like the new Motley Crue for a while, um, and then they don't seem to have the longevity of certain records that I uh, own, so I tend to go back to stuff like I don't know, Free the Free Story. Mm -hmm. I usually listen oh, to. Oh, the Motorhead there. Uh, <laughs> come back at the moment. Motor, we think Motorhead are coming back. Great. Listen to a lot of Motorhead. Look forward to that. <laughs> right, well, Billy and Ian, thanks very much. Thank you.